A civil aviation plane was flying at high altitude. Just before landing, he told Rose that there seemed to be something in the cargo hold. Rose was puzzled as there was no indication of live animals on the airway bill. Then, the two and opened the cargo door, but found nothing, but as they were about to close the door, suddenly something violently crashed into the door. Rose was frightened and immediately stood up. In the next second, the door was hit and twisted. At this moment, the airfield controller noticed that the plane had not landed at the designated location and that the lights and radar were turned off. He quickly reported the situation to Bishop. Bishop immediately contacted Redfern via radio, but there was no response. The airport personnel who sensed trouble immediately called the police, and soon many government agencies arrived at the scene. F, a leader at the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, was in the midst of a divorce due to long working hours causing family breakdown, just as the two were preparing to allocate their assets with the help of lawyers. F received a call from his colleague. After a brief explanation of the situation, he rushed to the scene immediately. Jimbo told F that the plane had been motionless for an hour and that no signs of life could be detected even with life detectors. It could kill 210 passengers within 10 minutes, and there was no other possibility except for the spread of a virus. So F and Nora put on level D protective suits and entered the plane. As soon as they entered the plane, the scene in front of them shocked them. They saw all the passengers sitting quietly in their seats, without any struggle or expression of pain. Soon, they made a discovery. Ammonia was permeating in the air. However, this wouldn't instantly kill the passengers. Then, F examined the body of a little girl, but found no clues. Nora took out a UV light. They saw green secretions all over the plane presumably left by some kind of organism. After discussing, they decided to split up. Nora went to the front of the plane, while F went to the back to investigate. F quickly arrived at the cargo door and shone a flashlight down, discovering that it was filled with green liquid. It seemed that something in the cargo hold attacked the plane, so F quickly asked his colleague to investigate the airline's cargo manifest. On the other side, Nora arrived at the cockpit and found that the cockpit door was open. She immediately reported it to her colleague. Upon hearing this, her colleague felt uneasy and asked Nora to leave immediately. But Nora, eager to find the truth, did not heed her colleague's advice. Just as Nora was about to examine Redfern's body, she found that Redfern and a few others were still alive. F told them that medical personnel were urgently needed. On the other side, Abraham saw the news about the plane and immediately sensed something was wrong. He then entered the basement and picked up a long sword made of pure silver. Slowly, he sat down in a chair with a jar containing a heart next to him. Meanwhile, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention isolated the survivors and questioned them about what happened on the plane. Redfern mentioned that his head was buzzing during landing, and then he couldn't remember anything. The same answer was given by other survivors. Unable to find answers, F had no choice but to investigate the cargo. To his surprise, there was a 3-meter tall, 1,500-pound coffin in the cargo hold. The coffin was carved with extremely strange patterns. What's even stranger is that this item was not listed on the airway bill. F instructed the staff to lay the coffin down, and then they all worked together to open the coffin lid. Inside, they found a pile of soil. This left F unsure of what to do, so he decided to have the soil analyzed. On the other side, Eichhorst arrived at Stoneheart Group. During the conversation between the two men, it was revealed that they were the ones who planned the incident. Their goal was to assemble a vampire army. The only thing left to do now is to get the coffins out. So, Eichhorst found Gus and asked him to drive a truck out of the airport. Following a specific route, they needed to reach Manhattan before sunrise. If anyone tried to stop them, they just needed to hand over the black card. As a reward, Gus's brother's criminal record would be cleared, and his mother's immigration status would be taken care of. Faced with such a generous reward, Gus agreed to participate. On the other side, a group of relatives of the deceased plane passengers had gathered at the airport. As the first person to enter the plane, F stepped forward to explain. At that moment, one of the relatives became very agitated and showed a photo, saying he wanted to see his daughter immediately. However, the cause of death of these victims was still unclear, and there were still some safety concerns. F could only promise to provide everyone with an answer within 48 hours. In the autopsy department of the CDC, Bennett reported clues to F. He discovered that all the victims had a 3cm incision on their necks, precisely at a depth that would not cause the rupture of the carotid artery. Currently, no medical instruments could achieve such precision. What's even stranger is that there was no trace of blood in any of the bodies. 
but instead, a white liquid flowed out. These were the clues found so far. Abraham found F and claimed to know what this disease was. To stop this disaster, all the deceased must be beheaded, and then their bodies must be burned with fire. F was taken aback by Abraham's words and thought he was not mentally stable. He instructed the airport security personnel to take him away. However, Abraham refused to give up and shouted at F. The coffin is the key. Don't let the coffin cross the river. Nora was puzzled by how Abraham knew about the coffin. The coffin had already been sealed. Suddenly, a mysterious voice kept echoing in his mind. He asked his colleague next to him, but the colleague said they didn't hear any voice. Unconsciously, he walked towards an abyss and found himself in a tunnel. There was a creature crawling ahead. Just as he was puzzled, a poisonous stinger pierced his major artery and started to suck his blood. In a matter of seconds, he was drained and turned into a lifeless corpse. But suddenly, the monster twisted his neck and smashed his head on the ground until it was completely crushed. After the event, the monster quickly fled the scene. Then it found the recently removed heart still beating in the autopsy room. He held the heart in his hand and examined it carefully, found a lot of nematode-like things on it. Feeling nauseous, he dropped the heart on the ground, but by now his gloves were crawling with nematodes. Then it quickly slaps the nematodes off his hand, but it's still too late. The nematodes have already burrowed into his skin. Using surgical forceps, Bennett managed to pull them out. However, at that moment, all the passengers who had died earlier suddenly woke up. He was overwhelmed by a group of corpses, who began to bite and devour him. On the other side, F and Nora arrived at the plane's cargo hold, where they also found clues. Several nematodes were found entangled in the dirt at the bottom of the cargo hold. F immediately realized that this was the soil from the coffin. They quickly ran to where the coffin was supposed to be. But upon arrival, they discovered that the coffin was missing. F hurriedly went to the surveillance room to investigate. He found out that just seven minutes ago, a shadow quickly lifted the coffin away. This left everyone stunned and bewildered. At that moment, Nora remembered Abraham's words. Don't let the coffin cross the river. F had an uneasy feeling upon hearing this. He quickly called Jimbo and ordered a strict prohibition on any vehicles entering or leaving the airport. On the other side, Gus had already arrived at the underground parking garage of the airport. Following Eichhorst's instructions, he found a truck. After getting in, he noticed a strange large box, but he didn't think much of it. Just as he approached the checkpoint, he was stopped by SWAT officers. Then, Gus promptly showed them the black card given to him by Eichhorst, but the officers didn't know what it was for. At that moment, a police dog started barking furiously, and the officers immediately asked Gus to step out of the vehicle for inspection. Just as he was about to be exposed, Jimbo arrived in time. The officers handed the black card to him. Upon seeing it, Jimbo quickly told the officers that Gus was on their side. The officers, reassured by Jimbo's words, immediately allowed Gus to proceed. Jimbo approached Gus and asked him to relay a message to Eichhorst, saying that this would be the last time he does things for him. Gus drove towards Manhattan, unaware of what was being transported in the vehicle. On the other side, he was deeply saddened by the sudden loss of his daughter. But suddenly, his daughter opened the door and walked in. He couldn't believe his eyes. Immediately, he hugged her with excitement. Unaware that his daughter was no longer human, the two celebrated that the plan was progressing smoothly. This city would soon be occupied by the vampire army. Gus arrived at his destination before dawn. After parking the car, he got out and realized that there was no one there to receive the delivery, so he opened the trunk to see what he was transporting. Suddenly, the coffin started shaking violently, frightening Gus, who quickly left the scene. It is not known how long it had been, but someone discovered his body. F received orders to investigate. F asked his colleagues various details. Upon learning that he was killed he investigating the coffin, F immediately felt that the matter was not simple. Then he brought a UV light. After turning it on, he indeed discovered green slime similar to what was inside the plane. Just then, F received a phone call, a command from above to release four survivors. Since the source of the infection was not identified, F rushed to stop the he hoped everyone would stay and continue the quarantine. Some viruses have an incubation period, and if they spread to the outside world, it would be uncontrollable. Several survivors insisted on going home. Because of the orders from above, F had to let them leave. Then F went to the CDC and found his boss, wanting to persuade her to continue isolating the survivors until the source of the infection was identified. Unexpectedly, 
the airline declared the incident as a mechanical failure to protect its stock price. All passengers were said to have died due to carbon monoxide leakage, which made F furious and he directly scolded the leader, he was forced to take a leave of absence as a result. After returning home, found out his wife's next had moved in, he and his son were renovating the house, and to make matters worse, he had to pay the mortgage himself. But F did not lose his temper, due to his long working hours. His relationship with his wife had already broken down, but what he couldn't accept was that his son chose to live with his wife during the trial. This made F very sad, so he decided to give up his family and fully devote himself to work. Since he was forced to take leave, F decided to secretly investigate on his own. He made an appointment with one of the survivors, Redfern. Redfern felt guilty about the deaths of the other 206 passengers, so he decided to cooperate with F. First, F took Redfern to the hospital for an examination, then F used UV light to search for clues. He also found a 2cm incision on Redfern's neck. The next moment, F found many worms under his skin. This made F feel that something was very wrong. He quickly contacted Bennett from the autopsy department, but the call was not answered. F quickly drove to the autopsy department, and on the way, he received a call from a family member of a plane crash victim. The person expressed gratitude to F and said that his daughter had safely arrived home. F was stunned upon hearing this. The first thing he saw on the plane was his daughter's body. Before F could say anything, the call was hung up. Then F arrived at the autopsy department and found it empty. Bennett was nowhere to be seen in the laboratory. The body bags were open, and the bodies were gone. After the father put down the phone, he was preparing to bathe his daughter, he touched his daughter's head. But unexpectedly, a large clump of hair stuck to his hand. Before he could figure out what was happening, the next moment, He was killed by his daughter, who had turned into a vampire. In the bathtub, on the other side, they arrived at the location of the coffin. At this moment, the coffin was open, and he began to welcome the arrival of the blood ancestor. When Gabe was intimate with three women, one of the women accidentally pulled out a strand of his hair. He didn't pay much attention to it and thought it was due to staying up late recently. Then Gabe saw the veins on the woman's neck and uncontrollably bit down on them. After the woman broke free, Gabe angrily told them to leave. The three women quickly escaped and cursed him as a madman. Later, Gabe was deeply attracted to the smell of blood and started licking the blood on the ground without realizing that he had become a vampire. On the other side, Eichhorst was sitting in front of a mirror and it turned out that he was also a vampire. He then began to dress himself up and put on makeup to cover up his pale skin. Eichhorst went to the Stoneheart group and wanted Jim to continue serving them. Jim says he's here to see Greg, but Eichhorst tells him Greg can't see him right now. As Jim was about to leave, Eichhorst mentioned the box on the plane. Jim said he only made a deal with Greg and allowed medical goods to pass through customs. After hearing this, Eichhorst took out a package and gave it to Jim, telling him that it was the payment promised by Greg. However, Jim didn't accept it and asked Eichhorst what was in the box and where the bodies from the plane crash went. Eichhorst didn't answer and then Jim said he was going to the police. At that moment, Eichhorst mentioned Jim's wife. He said they invested in a company that treats cancer, and if they continued to cooperate, he would approve Sylvia's entry into the monoclonal antibody clinical trial. Jim hesitated for a moment, but for the sake of his wife, he compromised. On the other side, Nora found Cetrakian who was causing trouble at the airport, but Cetrakian ignored her. He knew Nora came to him because all the bodies had disappeared. Cetrakian told her that he knew where the bodies went, but now it was too late. Nora asked him what was in the coffin, and Cetrakian told her that there was a powerful monster inside whose goal was to destroy the world and consume the light. Nora refused to give up and asked Cetrakian how to prevent the disaster. Cetrakian said the only way to stop the disaster is to find all the missing bodies and destroy them along with anyone who has come into contact with them. Meanwhile, F went to the home of the little girl who died in the plane crash to investigate the reason for the missing bodies. Strangely, the door was not locked and no one answered when he called out. At that moment something in the corner was watching him silently. F went to the bathroom and found a lot of hair scattered in the bathtub. 
Then he continued to search for clues. At that moment, F received a call from the hospital, so he rushed there directly. When he arrived at the hospital, he found Redfern's condition was abnormal and immediate surgery was necessary. Then F began to check Redfern's physical condition and found that nematodes began to reproduce crazily. They had to be removed to save his life. And F began to anxiously await the results of the operation. Just then, Jim suddenly walked over. F was angry when he saw him and asked where he had been for the past few days. Jim told him that during that time, he had been struggling to secure a spot for his wife's cancer surgery. F didn't suspect him too much after hearing that. At that moment, F heard a broadcast saying that Redfern was missing, so they quickly returned to the ward. The nurse said they had just finished preparing the things for the surgery when Redfern disappeared. F immediately asked everyone to search separately, and Jim eventually found him in the kitchen. At that moment, Redfern was holding a bag of blood and drinking it. The next second, Redfern attacked Jim, he pinned Jim against the wall, and then a stinger slowly emerged from Redfern's mouth. Just then, Nora arrives just in time, and Redfern shakes Nora off. Jim tried to subdue him, but Redfern's strength was terrifying, he easily threw Jim out, and then walked towards Nora. At this point, F rushed over, and he inquired what had happened. Nora quickly reminded F to stay away from Redfern. Nora then grabbed an iron rod and started fighting back, but it didn't do any harm to Redfern. F picked up a nearby fire extinguisher and smashed it on Redfern, finally subduing him. Just as everyone breathed a sigh of relief, Redfern grabbed Nora's leg. F saw this and smashed the fire extinguisher into his head again. Everyone was shocked to see the mutated Redfern. To understand this creature, they immediately performed an autopsy on the body. Nora discovered that he had evolved a new circulatory system. F then removes the 2 meter long stinger from Redfern's mouth. After research, F has generally confirmed that the creature sucks human blood and infects and parasitizes others. After that, they disposed of the body and discussed how to solve this matter. If they report it, the government will definitely cover up the news. There must be someone powerful pushing for this to happen, seeing how serious the situation was. Jim told F the truth. He said he was the one who allowed the van with the casket to pass after F closed the airport. He did all this to treat his wife's cancer. F, angered by this revelation, punched Jim on the other side. Gabe was looking in the mirror and noticed that his body was feeling uncomfortable. Not only did his pupils change color, but his hair also fell out in large areas. At the same time, Ansel also showed the same symptoms, and his dog kept barking at him. Ansel then opened the refrigerator and took out a raw steak. There was a voice in his head guiding him to eat it. He hesitated for a moment but couldn't resist the temptation. The scene was just in time for his wife to see it. And when he saw Marie he didn't explain, but walked straight up the stairs. That night, Marie knocked on Ansel's door, ready to talk to him. Ansel said he needed rest and asked Marie to take the children to their parents' house for a while. Marie sensed something was wrong with Ansel, so she had no choice but to take the children and leave. When Marie returned home again, she found the dog lying in a pool of blood. This left her at a loss for what to do. And then she heard a noise coming from the warehouse. So she opened the warehouse door, and as soon as she did, a strong smell hit her. The next second, Ansel rushed out. Run! Go away! Please, Annie! Go! Don't come near me! Never come back! <laughs> Marie did not leave. She buried the dog. She did not know what had happened to her husband. And now she can only pray silently that Ansel can recover. At this moment, the voice of a neighbor came from not far away. She was afraid that the neighbor would notice something unusual. So she hurried over, faced with the neighbor's verbal insults. Marie had a bold idea. Later, Tavler was taken to the warehouse. When Marie opened the door, he felt that something was wrong, and he was pushed in by Marie. Vasily saw a mouse, and then he followed the mouse to the riverside, only to see groups of mice fleeing from the sewer. Vasily, as an expert in catching mice, 
saw this scene for the first time, there must be something in the sewer that made these mice feel fearful, so Vasily curiously opened the manhole cover and went down alone, the sewer was pitch black, and after turning on the light, he found that the mice were still fleeing, then Vasily found a lot of sticky secretion on the wall, emitting an extremely foul smell, at this moment, a group of zombie-like creatures suddenly appeared in front of him, they all made animal-like roars at Vasily, seeing this, Vasily quickly escaped, Fortunately he wasn't too far from the wellhead, so he managed to escape. After escaping, he discovered the weakness of the monsters. On the other side, F and Nora sat in the car, not knowing how to solve the problem in front of them. These creatures that exceed human cognition are preparing to invade the city. If they report this to the government, they will definitely cover it up. So after discussing, the two of them decided to go to the families of the plane crash victims to find answers. Soon, the two of them arrived at Emma's house. Upon entering, F realized that someone was playing music, and then the two followed the sound to the basement, there they found the deceased Emma listening to music. F approached slowly and called out Emma's name. <laughs> Fortunately, Citrakian arrived in time. Under Nora's shock, Emma's father also rushed out. Citrakian severed his stinger and then ended his life. It turned out that Citrakian found Emma's house based on the passenger list provided by Nora. Nora can't accept Citrakian's handling of the situation, and she then leaves in a huff. Only F understood the situation of these people. If they didn't kill these creatures, they would continue to slaughter humans. F quickly found Nora and she questioned F. Their goal is to cure these people, so why kill them? F calmly explained that they are already dead and something else has taken over their bodies, for the safety of others, they must do this, Nora still couldn't understand and left resolutely, on the other hand, Gabe's agent brought in a doctor to examine Gabe's body, then she started preparing for the concert, just then, the agent heard screams coming from upstairs, she quickly ran upstairs, and when she saw what was in front of her, she immediately fled in fear, but the agent didn't choose to call the police, instead she contacted her boss, the boss told her not to panic, and he would handle the rest. On the other hand, F asked Citrakian if they should call the police. Citrakian said the government acts in its own interest, he has never believed in those people from the beginning. To kill these evil creatures, they can only rely on themselves. The disappearance of the 206 bodies is definitely not an accident. Someone must be manipulating everything behind the scenes. Their ultimate goal is to build a vampire army to rule humanity. The only way to prevent tragedy now is to find these survivors and decapitate them one by one. After dinner, Citrakian gave F a weapon. The silver needle inside can cause great damage to the vampires. The man walks into Gabe's room and doesn't panic for a second when he sees the body. It turns out that he is the person hired by the record company owner to destroy the body as a way to eliminate the negative information about the artist. Jack then opened his backpack and prepared to clean up the crime scene. When he noticed something unusual, he immediately drew his gun. Seeing it was Gabe, Jack explained why he was there and prepared an alibi for Gabe. Then he started cleaning up the crime scene, and Gabe looks at Jack, and the next thing he knows, he's attacking him. Jack beats Gabe in a couple of moves, and he's pissed off about it, so Jack shoots Gabe several times. Jack realized that what was coming out of his body was not blood, but a milky white liquid. While he was confused, Stinger stabbed him in the neck and Gabe drained his blood. On the other hand, F and Citrakian arrive at Ansel's house. When they enter the house, they find Ansel's wife has hanged herself. F goes to put her down, but Citrakian stops him. He took out a silver mirror and shined it at Marie. It turns out it's a test to see if she's infected by the bloods, and if she is, her mirror image will tremble. Marie was found to be uninfected. Just then, they heard a strange sound. The sound was coming from the warehouse in the backyard. They opened the door to the warehouse, and when they entered, they found a figure hiding in the corner. Ansel saw the two of them and immediately rushed at them, but luckily he was chained up. Citrakian tells F to use the silver nail gun, and then Citrakian spots the infected Tavler. He didn't hesitate for a second and just chopped his head off. Citrakian then filled the warehouse with gasoline and burned the body. F also videotaped the monster, enough evidence to tell the whole world. On the other side, Joan, the last survivor, began to show symptoms. She had no appetite for human food, but seeing her daughter's throbbing veins she had an urge to bite into them, so she rushed the nanny to take the children away. The nanny returned to the room to check Joan's condition and hoped that she could go to the hospital for examination, but Joan didn't think so. Suddenly Joan felt something in her eyes. The nanny went to check Joan's condition, but the next moment she was shocked. 
The nanny left the room and quickly went downstairs to pack her bags. She took the kids and left. But Joan found her. She had to lie and say she was taking the kids to the movies. Joan didn't answer, but started to approach the children. Luckily, the nanny interrupted him in time and told him that the movie was about to start. Joan snapped out of it and told them to go home early. That's how the nanny saved the children's lives. Eichhorst entered a room in which a man was imprisoned. He would be his dinner. Then, Eichhorst slowly turned the gears. <laughs> Tightening the man little by little, the restrained man shouted for help while Eichhorst enjoyed the fear of his food. In the man's despair, Eichhorst began to feed. After finishing, Eichhorst went to Stoneheart Group. They discussed launching an attack on humans during the solar eclipse. Vampires are terrified of sunlight, so the eclipse is the perfect time for the attack. By then, humans will become like lambs to be slaughtered. On the other side, F showed his superior the recorded video of the vampires, indicating that these creatures have started infecting people nearby. If they don't stop them, humanity will be doomed. His superior asked F to wait in the office while he went to report to the government. After his superior left, Jim told F to leave quickly as they wanted to arrest him. F sensed something was wrong when he saw his superior's expression while making a phone call. So immediately, he headed for the back door, but F's pass was revoked. Jim quickly swiped his own pass was, and successfully escorted F safely out of the building. Nora went to the nursing home to chat with her mother. Suddenly, a vampire appeared nearby, looking for food. The staff tried to help but got bitten by the vampire's stinger. Nora quickly took her mother and fled from there. The next day, Nora couldn't find any news reports about the incident. It seemed that F was telling the truth. Someone was manipulating things behind the scenes, hiding this event. She quickly packed her belongings preparing to leave the city with her mother. On the other side, F rushed to his ex-wife's house. He claimed that a very dangerous epidemic was spreading in the city and wanted his ex-wife to leave with their son immediately. His ex-wife found it absurd and they had a heated argument. Matt secretly called the police upon witnessing the situation. Soon, the police arrived and arrested F. Eichhorst once again found Gus and asked him to steal a corpse from the hospital. Gus, infuriated, punched Eichhorst in the face. To his surprise, Eichhorst was unharmed. He then punched his abdomen, but it had no effect. Instead, Eichhorst threw him several meters away with a single strike. Helpless, Gus reluctantly agreed to do one more task for him. On the other side, F was arrested and taken to the police station for questioning. He was accused of killing Redfern. F, realizing the situation, revealed everything about the virus and the vampires, but the detective thought F was insane and planned to send him directly to prison. F immediately mentioned that he knew where the body was and promised that everything would become clear once they saw it. Meanwhile, with Jim's help, Gus and two others successfully stole the Redfern body. During the process, Felix, out of curiosity, opened the body bag and a stinger protruded from it. Felix was terrified and, to avoid complications, he cooperated with Jim to throw the body into the river. Abraham had been fighting against the vampires for years, knowing that the government officials protected their own interests, so he silently slaughtered vampires. Carrying a passenger list from the plane, Abraham arrived at the next location. Upon entering the house, he found no one inside, confirming that the vampires were hiding there. Since they feared sunlight, the basement became their gathering place. As Abraham entered the basement, a strong smell of blood hit him. Slowly, Abraham walked forward and discovered a group of vampires sleeping. Just then, a vampire rushed towards him. Abraham first uses a silver spike gun to restrict his movement, then cuts his head off with a single stroke of his sword. Hearing the commotion, the other vampires woke up. But suddenly, Abraham's heart condition acted up, and he quickly took out his medication from his pocket. However, the vampires had already surrounded him. Accidentally, he dropped the medication on the ground. Helpless, Abraham could only fight with his silver spike gun while retreating. Luckily, it was daytime, and Abraham managed to escape unharmed. After a short rest, he placed candles on the stove and turned on the gas valve, intending to burn the vampires alive. On the other side, Vasily was discussing the creatures he saw in the sewer with his colleagues. His co-workers started laughing at him, seeing that they don't believe it. Vasily drew a picture of the creature's appearance and urged everyone to leave the city immediately. Then, Vasily returned to his company and found the entire place empty. This confused him, 
He went to the manager's office and noticed that the lights seemed to be broken, carrying a flashlight. He prepared to fix it, but suddenly he saw the manager sitting in the bathroom. The manager lunged at him as soon as he saw him. Then, his stinger slowly powered up. Luckily, the silly dodged in time and punched the manager, knocking him down. The silly knew the weak point of these monsters, so he quickly pulled open the curtains. As expected, the vampires exposed to sunlight started to burn. In just a few seconds, he was charred. Given the severity of the situation, Vasily rushed home to urge his parents to leave the city immediately. However, Vasily's father never approved of his career, that's why their relationship has been on ice. When Vasily mentioned the invasion of monsters, his father thought he must be crazy. Vasily was deeply saddened by his father's response. Soon, a solar eclipse phenomenon occurred, and everyone gathered on the streets to witness this rare spectacle. Meanwhile, F was being taken by the police to identify the crime scene. Suddenly, F spotted Bennett, the coroner who had turned into a vampire, searching for prey on the street. The police officer immediately moved forward to arrest him, but in the next moment, the monster had finished feasting and quickly left the scene. Only then did F get out of the car and approach the detective, requesting the handcuff keys. After the detective handed over the keys and asked for help, F simply said, I'm sorry after unlocking the handcuffs. He knew all too well that the detective had already been infected and was beyond saving. On another side, Gus and Felix were walking home when they encountered two panicked individuals running past them. It was Bennett, the vampire. Bennett approached and knocked Gus to the ground, then turned his attention to Felix. Just as it seemed critical, Gus struck Bennett on the head with a bat. A nematode from Bennett's brain accidentally splattered on Felix's hand. Gus immediately rushed to help but the police suddenly appeared and pinned them both to the ground. The solar eclipse ended quickly. The police station received numerous reports of terrifying attacks. Meanwhile, F arrived at Abraham's antique shop. Abraham opened the door and let F inside, and they both entered a secret room. To F's surprise, he encountered Nora and her mother in the room. Thus, the team to fight against the demonic forces officially formed. On the other side, Lus returned home after work. Just as he got out of the car and was about to enter his house, a vampire targeted him. Seeing blood stains all over the vampire's mouth, Lus immediately turned around and ran. He quickly took refuge in a taxi and urged the driver to drive away. The driver got out of the car with a gun, ready to fend off the monster, but unsurprisingly, he got killed by the creature. Then, Lus took the opportunity while the monster was feasting on the driver and quickly ran into his house. But to his astonishment, he found out that his wife had also turned into one of these creatures. <laughs> F and the others crafted numerous bullets made of silver to effectively eliminate the monsters. At this point, F expressed doubts, questioning how they could possibly kill all the vampires by themselves. He suggested broadcasting a video to unite all of humanity in resistance. After hearing this, Abraham advised him to give up on that idea. The man behind the curtain has gone to a lot of trouble to fight him at all. The only way to stop this disaster now is to find the source of the virus, the blood ancestor, and the only way to stop it is to kill him. They also needed to recruit more teammates to join the fight. Gus came to the station desperately trying to argue that Bennett wasn't even human. Not only was his blood white, but he also had a two meter long spike in his mouth. The police didn't take it seriously. Subsequently, Gus and Felix were locked up. By this time, Felix had already been infected by the virus. He had a high fever and difficulty breathing. It's a symptom that the nematodes are multiplying inside him. Gus immediately found a prison guard, hoping to have a doctor examine Felix. But the guards don't care about him. On the other side, Jim was well aware that the city was infested with vampires, so he planned to escape with his wife. But just then, F and the others arrived. After entering the house, F revealed their purpose for coming. He wanted Jim to join the team and lure Eichhorst out. If they didn't stop their plans, all of humanity would be wiped out. Jim decided to team up with F and take action. Before that, he sent his wife away. Now with no ties holding him back, Jim officially joined the team. Abraham also gave Jim a small self-defense knife. Soon Eichhorst got a message from Jim. Jim threatened with all sorts of things for him to do and told Eichhorst to come to the subway station in person with $100,000 or else he'd expose him for everything he'd been up to. Eichhorst knew this was a trap. He planned to take this opportunity to eliminate the people opposing him. Soon Eichhorst arrived at the subway station for his appointment. He was furious about Jim's betrayal. Fortunately, they chose to meet at the subway station. Otherwise, Jim would not have survived. 
Then, Ikorse turned and left the scene. F and the others, who were lying in wait, prepared to take action. They followed Ikorse to the platform, but suddenly, he disappeared into the crowd. In another instant, Abraham encountered Ikorse at another subway entrance. The two had been in a long-standing battle without a clear winner. Abraham made a direct sword attack, but Ikorse easily dodged it. Abraham launched another attack, but Ikorse swiftly gained control over him. Then Ikorse's flesh thorn began to accumulate strength. At that moment, Ikorse's lower leg was shot. It turned out that F and the others had arrived just in time. Ikorse saw that there were many of them and that they had silver pistols. So he fled in a hurry. The plan to capture Ikorse failed. He would surely be more cautious next time. On the other side, the nanny brought the children to the house for shelter. Her daughter returned home from work and asked why the children weren't sent back. The nanny explained that it was dangerous there, but her daughter didn't believe her. She insisted on taking the children to their parents' place. Little did she know that this decision would cost her life. Soon the group arrived at Joan's house and the kids excitedly got out of the car and ran towards the house. The nanny immediately called out to Mr. and Mrs. Joan, but there was no response. Just then, the little daughter let out a scream. The nanny quickly ran over and entered the living room, only to find that Lus was already dead. Nanny urged her daughter to leave quickly, but her daughter wanted to take Lus to the hospital. Little did they know, the vampire clan had quietly approached them from behind. The nanny's daughter defended against the vampire's attack with her hands. Faced with the mutated monster, Joan, everyone was scared and immediately started running away. The vampires began to chase after them, but luckily, a beam of sunlight blocked their attack. Then, in a hurry, the nanny and the others hid in the study and tightly blocked the door with a desk. What's wrong with my mama? <laughs> the nanny was so scared that she hid under the table and started praying hoping that God could help them. At this moment, the vampires started using a baseball bat to violently break the glass. After the door was destroyed, the vampires slowly entered. When she saw her daughter, she began to build up her strength. At this moment, the vampire was shot. Witnessing this scene, everyone was stunned. The nanny's daughter looked and discovered that the person who saved them was a mysterious figure dressed in black. Seeing that this person had no ill intentions, the nanny led the children out. But the black-clad person asked them to stay where they were and ask if the monster hurt them. And the nanny said only her daughter had been accidentally scratched. Seeing this, the black-clad person approached and examined the wound, confirming that it was a blood scratch. He told a few people to get up first. After the nanny led the children away, the black-clad person separately stopped the nanny's daughter, just as the nanny turned around to look. <laughs> On the other hand, Abraham came to a medical equipment store to fight the bloods. Since it was closed at night, F started breaking the window. After entering the store, they began searching for UV lamps because it had the same effect as sunlight. While searching, they encountered Vasily. Through conversation, they learned that he had also battled the vampires and knew their weakness was UV light. By this time, he had collected all the UV lamps in the store. Nora hoped that Vasily could share some with them. In response to Nora's request, Vasily agreed. After they came out, they went to the gas station across the street to buy some food. At this time, Abraham greatly admired Vasily. He hoped that Vasily could join their team to fight against the vampires. But Vasily had always been a lone wolf and refused Abraham's invitation. Just then, Abraham saw a vampire heading towards the gas station, so he grabbed his sword and walked over. At the same time, F, who was shopping, also noticed the vampire. As he was about to go out to fight, Abraham directly beheaded him with his sword. Soon, Another vampire approached upon hearing the noise. Abraham restrained him with a silver spike gun, and then beheaded him with his sword. At this moment, another vampire prepared to ambush them. Luckily, Vasily appeared in time and attacked him. Then, more vampires gathered around. F immediately went out to help upon seeing this. Silver bullets caused greater damage to the vampires. So everyone fought against the vampires attacked together. An old man was unfortunately bitten on the neck while trying to escape. Jim saw this and quickly ran back into the store. Then, he charged the UV lamp and took it outside, facing the approaching vampires. Jim directly turned on the UV lamp. One vampire launched a surprise attack. Fortunately, Abraham provided timely support and managed to kill that vampire. Seeing more vampires gathering and their numbers increasing, everyone had to quickly retreat into the house to avoid their aggression. Once inside, they looked at the growing vampire army outside, feeling at a loss. Now it was difficult to break through and escape. 
At this point Jim ran to the restroom alone to clean up his freshly scratched face. It was just a minor cut, so Jim didn't pay much attention to it. There were still other customers in the store, and they were asking F what had happened. Upon hearing F's explanation about vampires, one woman had a breakdown, taking advantage of everyone's distraction, she opened the door and ran out. This shocked everyone on the spot, but unexpectedly, the woman managed to run out of the vampire encirclement. Even more strangely, the vampires didn't continue pursuing her. Abraham explained the situation. Those vampires were under control, and their mission was to kill themselves. The store clerk and customers were furious upon hearing this. Ignoring F's attempts to stop them, the two of them rushed out without hesitation. Dutch was frightened and fell to the ground, and F quickly rushed out with the UV lamp. With the tacit cooperation of Nora, Dutch finally managed to be rescued into the house. F was angry about this and told everyone not to sacrifice themselves anymore. Then everyone stood still in place again. At this moment, Nora noticed something on Jim's face. Using the UV lamp, she discovered a nematode worm on his face. F immediately started searching for tools and took Jim to the warehouse for surgery. Suddenly, there was a loud noise from the roof, and Vasily and the others quickly went out to investigate. They found the vampires trying to find a breakthrough at the gas station. Meanwhile, F had already started the surgery. He made a large incision on Jim's face and used forceps to remove the nematode. Then F placed it on the table, and Nora used the UV lamp to kill it completely. Just then, the door was smashed open by a vampire. F and Abraham came to deal with him. At that moment, Abraham noticed something was wrong. He immediately rushed out of the store and indeed found a vampire trying to sabotage the power supply. Abraham aimed at him, but was ultimately a step too late. The power system was destroyed, and the whole gas station plunged into darkness. Now they could only rely on the remaining UV lamps to fend off the vampires outside. At the same time, cries for help came from behind. F immediately went to support them. By now, the vampires had already rushed in through the back door. Everyone had to retreat again and use the shelves to block the vampires' attack. Now they were caught in a dilemma, and the UV lamps could only last for another 20 minutes at most. Their only hope was the van outside, but it was too far away. They needed to make thorough preparations to have a chance to escape. Then everyone searched the supermarket for any useful items. They used alcohol to make Molotov cocktails, as fire was also a weakness of the vampires. However, F noticed another nematodes on Jim's forehead. He approached and removed Jim's clothes, and under the UV light, they saw hundreds of nematodes wriggling inside him. This shocked everyone present, and Jim fell into despair. He knew he would definitely turn into a vampire, so Jim hoped F would kill him. But F didn't want to give up on his longtime friend and said they would go to the hospital for treatment later. However, the red fern less fate in the hospital haunted Jim. This kind of virus was incurable, and the group began to argue fiercely. Just then, there was a noise from above. And Abraham says it's too late if we don't get going. The silly directly shot Jim, which was met with condemnation, but the most important thing now was to leave this place quickly, otherwise, they would all be buried here. As they started to move, the vampires broke through the last line of defense. Everyone formed a circle with the UV lamps, blocking the vampires' attack. But the battery was running out and they had to get into the car quickly, then Vasily threw the incendiary bomb he had just made, and the fire indeed stopped the vampires' attack. The crowd just fought and retreated, and then a few people came to the gas pumps. They're going to blow up every single strigo in the gas station. The silly poured gasoline on the ground to start the fire. F took the opportunity to run over to the supermarket delivery man who had just been killed and found the car keys. The others were still fighting against the vampire army. The UV lamp quickly ran out of power. At this moment, F opened the door of the truck, and everyone quickly climbed inside upon seeing the situation. After throwing the last Molotov cocktail, the silly also got into the car. At this moment, a vampire tried to stop the car but ended up being turned into a pile of flesh after being hit. The gas station exploded in the next second, and everyone successfully escaped from the vampire's siege. On the other side, Zack returned home to find it in a mess. Just as he called out for his mother, Matt, who had turned into a vampire, walked out. At this time, F and the others also arrived at the house by car, and he planned to take his son to a safer place. But as soon as they entered the house, they discovered vampire attacking Zack. F immediately rushed forward and stabbed him with a knife. Nora and the others who were waiting outside heard the sound of the fight and quickly ran to support. F picked up a shovel and knocked the vampire down to the ground, and then shoveled his head off. After finishing, F quickly checked if his son was hurt. Fortunately, there were no bite marks on him, and the others outside hurriedly came over, 
F quickly calmed his son's emotions. Abraham asked F where the basement was at this time. He wanted to check if there were any other vampires. After hearing this, F approached and said that if they found Kelly infected, he hoped they wouldn't do anything in front of his son. Abraham agreed and then F came back to Zach to ask where Kelly was. Zach said he didn't know, but that his mom had a fight with Matt this morning and left. F was relieved to hear that. Soon after Abraham finished checking the house, there was no other blood here. Upon seeing this, F asked Abraham to take Zach to the antique store. F stayed here with Nora to deal with the bodies. Abraham told F to burn them. Felix was accidentally invaded by the bloodworms and slowly began to feel unwell in the prison. Gus immediately found a prison guard and hoped that a doctor could examine Felix's condition. However, the guard was impatient and said that there would be a dedicated doctor to check after they were transferred to another prison. Soon, Gus and several inmates were squeezed into a car. During the journey, Felix's condition worsened, and Gus asked about his health. Unfortunately, the driver was bitten by a flesh spike and lost control of the car instantly. The car crashed to a stop by the roadside. Then a prison guard quickly got out of the car and opened the back door, but as soon as he entered, he was bitten in the neck by the vampire Felix. Gus took the opportunity to find the handcuff key on the guard and quickly freed himself. However, he also caught Felix's attention at this point. So Gus grabbed the gun from the prison guard. Shut up! and threw the key to the other inmates before swiftly escaping from there. On the other side, Abraham led the group into his secret base. He knew well that the vampires would nest in the sewers, so let's hope that Vasily, with his years of experience as a rat hunter, upon hearing this, Vasily immediately agreed without hesitation, but he needed to make a trip back home to get some tools. Meanwhile, F and Nora took care of the vampire bodies and performed a cremation outside. Afterward, they entered the house, feeling mentally exhausted from recent events. Under the four eyes, the two seemed to have reached some kind of tacit understanding. The two of them lay exhausted on the ground, but at that moment, someone barged in. It turned out to be Diane. She came here because she couldn't contact Kelly. F asked Diane to leave the city quickly. On the other hand Dutch learns from talking to Abraham that the man behind all this is Palmer, which shocks Dutch on the spot. It turns out that just a few days ago, Palmer hired her specifically to sabotage the city's servers as a result. The entire city's information cannot be spread. She realized how foolish her actions were. Abraham, upon hearing this, didn't get angry. He knew that human weakness was greed. But it was important to acknowledge and correct one's mistakes. The next day, F found his wife's car on the street, strangely with the doors unlocked. Upon entering the car, he discovered a pool of blood on the passenger seat, which immediately filled F with unease. 32 hours ago Kelly came home from work to find Matt looking at she evilly. In the next moment, the mutated Matt attacked Kelly directly. This frightened Kelly to the point of being dumbfounded, and she grabbed something nearby and threw it at him. Unfortunately, a worm accidentally splashed onto her face and directly entered her eye. Before Kelly could react, Matt attacked her again. She grabbed something else and threw it at him. Taking advantage of Matt's momentary distraction, she quickly ran outside. At the last moment, she successfully escaped from the house. Kelly got into the car and looked at her eyes. Nematodes had already started reproducing inside her eyeballs. It turns out that everything F said before was true. Shortly after, Kelly began to lie on the steering wheel and cry in pain. The discomfort of her body made Kelly faint on the spot. It was soon nightfall when Kelly woke up from her coma. At that moment she remembers that she hasn't picked up Zach yet. So Kelly immediately rushes over there. After arriving at the cram school, the teacher told her that Zach had been sent home by someone she had sent. Kelly was shocked to hear this because the mutated Matt was still at home. Immediately after, Kelly rushed home. Halfway through, she discovers someone who's as mutated as Matt. The two of them looked at each other, but the vampires did not attack Kelly because she had turned into a vampire herself. On the other hand, Vasily brought a tunnel layout map from home. After his investigation, there were several locations that were likely vampire nests. To further confirm, they needed to search the traffic archives online, but now the network is paralyzed, and they can't go online at all. At this time, Dutch said that the network can still be restored, but they need to enter the Stoneheart group. After hearing this, Vasily said that he had a way. He could use his identity as a mouse catcher to sneak in, and Dutch would act as his assistant. There's no time to waste. And the two immediately started their actions. After entering the Stoneheart group, they were stopped by the front desk because they did not have an appointment. Vasily started negotiating with the front desk. Surprisingly, he succeeded, and they both got on the elevator. But when the door opened, 
A group of bodyguards was waiting for them at the elevator entrance. Soon, Dutch was brought in front of Palmer. It turned out that their identity was exposed the moment they entered the Stoneheart group. Then, Dutch questioned Palmer why he wanted to destroy humanity. His explanation was that human life is too short, and he is now in the twilight of his life. If he dies, everything he has will no longer exist, so he wants to change the human genes to achieve immortality. After hearing this, Dutch angrily slapped Palmer because his selfishness would harm the whole world. Palmer was very angry about this and had his assistant take her away. Then the two of them were taken away by the bodyguards. Halfway through, Fitzwilliam said he would let them go because he didn't agree with Palmer's approach either. After hearing this, the two wanted them to join the demon hunting team, but Fitzwilliam said that he could not disobey Palmer's orders. Then they can only escape from here quickly. On the other side, mutated Kelly came to Diane and asked where Zack was after entering the house. Diane was heartbroken when she saw the injuries on Kelly's body, and she asked if Matt had caused them. At this moment, Diane's son came down from upstairs. By now, Kelly had turned into a vampire. Diane immediately tried to stop Kelly, but Kelly pushed her aside. In Diane's astonished gaze, she also became Kelly's prey. <laughs> Kelly came to the street, where normal people saw a couple, but in Kelly's eyes, they were fresh food. Then, a voice echoed in Kelly's ears, and upon careful listening, she realized that someone was calling her. Following the voice, Kelly followed the guidance and walked to an abandoned subway station. Soon, she arrived at the deepest part, and suddenly a dark figure flashed by. Rejoice! Embrace your glorious fate! On the other side, F arrived at Diane's house. He noticed that the door was unlocked, so he cautiously took out his gun. There was no response after calling out. So F went to the living room. He found signs of a struggle there. So F concluded that something must have happened to Diane. The vampires like to hide in dark places. So F came to the basement. He took a flashlight and shone it into the depths, and indeed found Diane and her son. At this moment, Diane heard the noise and woke up, preparing to attack F. F had no choice but to shoot her to end her suffering, and then Diane's son was also awakened. Although he didn't want to, he had to shoot him too. Afterwards, F saw something in Diane's hand. He was very familiar with this thing. It was the necklace he gave to Kelly when they got married. F couldn't bear it anymore. He started crying like a child. Soon, F returned to the antique shop. He couldn't accept that Kelly had become a vampire. At this time, Vasily and the others also came back. When F saw Dutch, she started to curse. It was all because of her that the network was paralyzed. If he had contacted Kelly earlier, she wouldn't have had an accident. Dutch was very sad about this. So she left the vampire hunting team. On the other hand, Gus escaped and returned home. When he entered the house, he smelled a pungent odor. Then Gus went to the living room and found Crispin watching a football game. Gus asked where his mother was. And the next second, Crispin slowly turned his head. Seeing that Crispin had also become a vampire, Gus slowly picked up the baseball bat next to him. Then Crispin started attacking him, and the two fought each other. Gus searched for his mother in the room and heard a sound coming from the closet. When Gus opened the closet, he found his mom lying in the closet, already turned into a vampire. Gus broke down when he saw this. Within a day, all his loved ones had turned into vampires. At this moment, he had nothing to lose, so he decided to hunt down the vampires. He encountered his vampire neighbor as soon as he reached the door, so he rushed up with an axe. Many people in this city have been transformed into vampires. If the exorcist team wants to eliminate them completely, they must kill the blood ancestor. This mission is very difficult, so they must be fully prepared. Vasily even made a UV bomb, which can instantly harm a group of vampires. After everything is ready, the exorcism team is ready to set out to find the blood ancestor. Before that, F left Zack and Nora's mother in the antique shop. The group drove on the road and found that the streets were already in chaos. Citrakian said that this is what the blood ancestor wants to see. The more chaotic humans are, the easier it will be for him to rule the world. Soon everyone came to a subway station. As soon as they arrived, they smelled an unpleasant smell. It seems that Vasily's intelligence is accurate. After entering the tunnel, the surrounding area is very dark and damp, and vampires like to gather in places like this. Sure enough, 
Cetrakian's words were quickly verified, and there were many items scattered on the ground. On the other side, Martinez stood outside the house seeking help, and Zach heard it and came over. Martinez suffers from Alzheimer's and irritability, and she ran out of cigarettes and wanted to go out and buy some. Zach asked Martinez to wait in the basement, and he went out to get some cigarettes. Soon Zach arrived at a nearby supermarket and found that there was no one inside. Then Zach came to the checkout counter and found a person lying inside, and the cigarettes were next to him. Just when Zach was about to reach out and grab it, another couple came into the supermarket. Zach quickly hid when he saw them and followed the conveyor belt to the warehouse. At this moment, Zach found a vampire sitting in the warehouse and resting. He felt scared and desperately climbed up, but his phone accidentally fell to the ground halfway. There were photos of his mother in the phone, so Zach decided to take the risk and retrieve the phone. He carefully jumped down from the conveyor belt and proceeded cautiously. When Zach got the phone, it was already broken. What was even more frightening was that he found that the vampire had disappeared. Zach started climbing desperately upwards, and he finally climbed out of the warehouse safely. Then Zach immediately ran outside. Just as he reached the door, he bumped into the couple who had just entered. The man thought Zach was hiding something good, so he curiously walked into the warehouse. Just when Zach thought he couldn't escape, he unexpectedly met Gus. Gus heard the screams coming from the warehouse and went there with an axe. Zach immediately fled the scene, not forgetting to take the cigarettes for Martinez. On the other side, Citrakian came to the depths of the tunnel, where they found hundreds of resting vampires. Upon seeing this, Vasily wanted to step forward and kill them all, but Citrakian stopped him. He said that if they alerted them, the blood ancestor would notice, so they needed to walk past slowly. Because these vampires are newly mutated, they need to rest to restore their physical strength. As long as there wasn't too much noise, they wouldn't wake up. And in the end, they passed by without incident. Then the group continued to walk deeper, but suddenly a vampire came slowly from the front. Vasily took out a silver nail gun, but Cetrakian stopped him, saying that they couldn't expose themselves yet. Just when everyone didn't know what to do, the vampire accidentally stepped on a high voltage wire. They found a new weakness of the vampires. Then the group continued to walk inside and found a lot of green sticky substance on the ground. But the strange thing is that there is no road ahead at all. F shone his flashlight over and found that the vampires had dug a passage. Citrakian said it might be a trap. After hearing this, F put the ultraviolet lamp aside and crawled into the hole. The hole was very narrow. and F quickly crawled out of the hole. He then signaled that everyone could come over, but at that moment, a couple of bloods came from the back. Vasily tells the two of them to crawl through while he holds them off. Citrakian starts to go through the cave, and just as he's about to exit, F hears Telly's voice. Even though Citrakian says it's a trap, F follows the voice. F. Nora's side is fighting off the Strigoi, but they're getting outnumbered. Vasily tells Nora to crawl over to him while he cleans up the rest of the Strigoi. When he was done, Vasily quickly went into the hole. At first it went well, but when he reached the entrance of the hole, Vasily got stuck because of his size. At that moment, the Strigoi were already crawling over. Nora saw this and dragged Vasily out. Just in the nick of time, Vasily was successfully pulled out. The two of them could not see F, so they could only go inside first. At this moment, F had already arrived at the Blood Ancestor's lair. Then he lifted the lid of the coffin as if he was crazy, but there was nothing inside. At that moment, F realized that he was surrounded by hordes of bloods. Suddenly a huge figure fell from the sky. This was the first time he saw the true face of Blood Ancestor. F saw this and launched an attack directly, but he was no match for the Blood Ancestor. Even if he uses weapons, it will have no effect. Then the Blood Ancestor slowly spit out the stinger. At this time, Citrakian appeared in time and interrupted the Blood Ancestor. Then Vasily and Nora came over, and he threw a UV bomb. After pressing the switch, all vampires began to be exposed to ultraviolet rays. The Blood Ancestor also took advantage of the chaos to escape from here. It was only then that everyone realized that this was all a trap for the Blood Ancestor. He had lured them here, but Citrakian has lost his mind at this point, and he questions Vasily about why he dropped the UV bomb, thus allowing the Blood Ancestor to escape. Citrakian then took a hammer and started smashing the coffin relentlessly. He swore to kill every last vampire. After venting his anger, Citrakian continued leading everyone further inside. Nora tried to persuade him not to act impulsively, but Citrakian had clearly lost his sanity. 
Soon, they discovered an extremely deep cave. Vasily threw an illumination flare inside. What they saw next was beyond belief. Countless vampires were gathered inside. But Cetrakian showed no fear. He grabbed his sword and prepared to charge. But Vasily immediately stopped him. He pointed out that facing so many vampires, going in would mean death. They quickly pulled Cetrakian away. After returning to the antique shop, the group began discussing strategies. They realized that they couldn't possibly fight against the vampire army with just a few of them. Furthermore, the others had no idea about the existence of vampires, putting the group in a difficult situation. Just then, Dutch returned to the antique shop with good news. She informed everyone that there was a way to broadcast the information about the viral outbreak in the city to the world. They could use the emergency alert system to interrupt television broadcasts. The purpose of the emergency alert system was to allow the president to make announcements to the entire nation during times of war or crisis. The advantage of the emergency alert system was that it didn't require any filtering or approval. Dutch could use it to broadcast F's video on television and radio. Although they only had 30 seconds, it would be enough for them. Dutch quickly adjusted the equipment. When the countdown ended, F appeared on the television program. After a brief introduction, F began informing the national audience about the infectious disease spreading in the city. F said that this virus invades the host's body through rough corrosion, and the carrier of this parasitic worm is transmitted to the victim through the stinger. If they are infected by the virus, they will hunt down ordinary people, and their nemesis is the sun. As soon as the time was up, the television returned to normal programming. Although humans might initially be skeptical upon hearing the news, at least they would become more vigilant. Just as the group was about to celebrate, they heard a scream from upstairs. When they rushed to the scene, they discovered that Gabe had barged in. He was in the process of feeding on Martinez. The silly charged at him, but Gabe managed to dodge. F joined the fight immediately. At that moment, more vampires rushed in. F quickly instructed everyone to take cover in the basement. Meanwhile, Eichhorst arrived at the antique shop with a few vampires. The actions of the vampire hunting team had completely enraged the master. Once everyone was hiding in the basement, Cetrakian revealed that he had anticipated this day and had purposely left an escape route. This gave the group newfound hope, and they began preparing to retreat and gather their equipment. However, before leaving, they needed to deal with Nora's mother. F approached Martinez with a silver sword and asked Nora to leave first. Nora knew that being bitten by a vampire was incurable. After intense internal struggle, Nora took the silver sword and prepared to take matters into her own hands. Facing her own mother, Nora ultimately killed her. Cetrakian then led Nora away from the scene. By the time Eichhorst entered the basement, the vampire hunting team had already left. On the other side, in order to fight against the vampires, Gus found the arms dealer Cream. Faced with Gus's threat, Cream had no choice but to take him to the docks. Got an AR-15, MP5, and a couple of pistols. Just as Gus was about to leave, they suddenly heard a car approaching. Cream claimed it was his client and that it would only take two minutes to deal with them. Soon a man came in. He put the bag on the table, told him that the goods must be delivered on time tomorrow, and then left. Gus asked Cream to get the bag, and it turned out that there was $100,000 in it. Cream advised Gus to stop meddling in other people's business and leave as soon as he got the gun. But Gus was curious about what was in the box, and it was worth $100,000. Cream had no choice but to take him to check. When they opened the cargo box, all of them were vampires. There were so many vampires that Gus and Cream had to fight their way out while retreating. Soon, they ran out of bullets. Just then, A group of armed individuals dressed in black appeared. They began hunting down the vampires. Quinlan appeared, and their mission this time was not only to eliminate the vampires but also to take Gus with them. Palmer was on the brink of death when suddenly a mysterious figure flashed by. He looked towards the door, but no one entered. When he turned his head, he found that the blood ancestor had come to his bedside. Palmer was very excited after seeing the blood ancestor. He asked the blood ancestor to save him. After hearing this, the blood ancestor also abided by the agreement. He grabbed Palmer's face and then slowly stretched out his hand. Thank you. Fitzwilliam entered the office, intending to change Palmer's medicine, but Palmer was nowhere to be found on the sickbed. Instead, Fitzwilliam saw Palmer standing outside in the rain. At this moment, 
Palmer has been completely transformed, and all the diseases on his body have disappeared. On the other side, Gus was taken underground by Vaughn. Vaughn took off his hat, and Gus realized that he wasn't human, curious. Gus asked him what he wanted. Instead of answering, Vaughn untied Gus first. Gus's sneak attack failed. Vaughn was not angry, but took Gus to a place. On the other side, Palmer, who had regained his new life, arrived at Citrakian's antique shop. He ordered his men to take everything away. Then Eichhorst came over, and Palmer happily shared with him the joy of rebirth and asked when he could have a stinger. Eichhorst smiled and explained that Palmer was not yet a vampire. The master had only fed him blood, not the worms. Palmer questioned why so many people in the city had been turned into vampires, while he hadn't. Upon seeing this, Eichhorst quickly stepped forward to comfort him. He said that the blood ancestor chose Palmer, so as long as he was loyal enough, he would be recognized by the blood ancestor one day. On the other hand, Eth and the others escaped from the antique shop and arrived at Vasily's home. They found Gabe's bar on the passenger manifest of the plane. They believed that it could be a gathering place for vampires. So Eth and Vasily decided to investigate. They quickly arrived at the destination, only to find the front gate tightly closed. However, with Vasily's familiarity with the area, he soon found the back door of the bar. They quietly made their way to the basement, but found no signs of vampires. Then, Vasily discovered a hidden room behind a shelf. They entered the room cautiously, after passing through the passage. They found the coffin of the blood ancestor, and judged that the blood ancestor must be nearby. They found a group of resting vampires, who were the master's bodyguards. They quickly left the area. Before leaving, Vasily lifted the manhole cover. He wanted to trap the vampires in that area using sunlight. On the other side, Palmer was saddened by not becoming a vampire. But now, there was a new problem. Maggie from the CDC wanted to quarantine the entire city to prevent the virus from spreading. It seemed that F's news had an impact. Locking down the city will control the speed of infection, so Palmer must talk to Maggie in person. Palmer instructed Fitzwilliam to prepare the car, but Fitzwilliam defied Palmer's orders. In the end, Fitzwilliam resigned and left. Left with no choice, Palmer took Eichhorst to the CDC. Although Maggie and Palmer had been working together, she only realized the severity of the situation after seeing F's news. Despite Palmer's repeated pleas, Maggie insisted on quarantining the city. Unable to persuade her, Palmer forcefully threw her downstairs. Arnes was shocked by the sight before him. He knew that Palmer had immense power and had no choice but to submit. The three vampires before them were the progenitors of the vampires. Gus asked Vaughn if they were still alive. Vaughn explained that they were in a state of meditation. The words of the patriarchs will be conveyed by him. Soon, Vaughn revealed the purpose of bringing Gus here. The vampires had been wreaking havoc on human society, breaking the truce agreement. So they need a brave human warrior. Due to Gus's exceptional abilities, the three elders unanimously voted for Gus to participate in the vampire power struggle. On the other side, F returned home and found Zack. Knowing that it wasn't safe for him to be alone, he decided to take Zack with him to the vampire lair. Additionally, he gave Zack a silver sword to protect himself. With everything prepared, they once again arrived at the vampire lair. Vasily found that the manhole cover he lifted worked and a group of vampires were blocked by the sun. Then, Vasily instructed everyone to retreat for the time being. Fire in the hole, vermin! After a loud explosion, the tunnel fell silent. Following that, the group continued towards the master's lair. Upon reaching the bar, they encountered a large gathering of vampires. Citrakian and the others were prepared for a fierce battle using various silver weapons to dominate the fight. The ordinary vampires were no match for them. Citrakian and F then proceeded to the second floor to search for the master. Vasily and the remaining three stayed behind to deal with the vampires. Just then Gabe and Eichhorst joined the battle, and everyone fell into passivity again. At this time Citrakian came upstairs, and the blood ancestor came to him again. F knew that Citrakian was no match for him, so he directly broke the window above his head, and the sunlight instantly burned the blood ancestor. Then F broke other glasses one after another, trying to let all the sunlight in. The blood ancestor was forced into a corner by sunshine at this time. When F took the knife and prepared to fight him to the death, 
the blood ancestor chose to jump out of the window, the sunlight immediately engulfed him. Meanwhile, Eichhorst prepared to kill Vasily. Suddenly, he felt that the blood ancestor was threatened by his life. So Eichhorst quickly took the vampires to support him. At this time, the blood ancestor who was exposed to the sun was in great pain, and Cetrakian was ready to take his life when he saw this. But the next second, the blood ancestor actually stood up in the sun, roared and fled from here. Then Vasily and others came upstairs and were shocked to learn that the blood ancestor had escaped. This reduced everyone's morale to the extreme. On their way back, Zack suddenly had an asthma attack. Unable to do anything, F had to take Zack back home to get his medication. Finally, F found it. And when Zack came out, he saw Zack holding Kelly's photo album. It turned out that Zack had been pretending to have asthma, which infuriated F. Knowing that Kelly, now a vampire, would surely be searching for Zack everywhere, a dark figure suddenly flashed by the window, F sensed trouble and slowly picked up his handgun. As F and Zack reached the back door, they noticed a figure standing in the backyard. Upon closer inspection, it was Kelly. Zack wanted to rush over to her. Luckily, F grabbed Zack in time and shot Kelly in the shoulder. Kelly silently left, and the vampire hunting team arrived shortly after hearing the gunshot. After learning that Kelly appeared, Cetrakian said that this was a method used by the blood ancestor. He manipulated human emotions to set traps. And even in failure, he would not give up. Soon, the group was driving on the highway. Looking at the devastated city, they didn't know who would ultimately emerge victorious. Although everyone failed in this mission, the blood ancestor also suffered heavy losses. He used his last strength to summon Eichhorst and told him two things. Firstly, he needed Eichhorst to find him a new body as his current one had been burned by sunlight and was beyond repair. Secondly, he ordered Eichhorst to gather an army of vampires for a furious retaliation against the vampire hunting team. Cetrakian's lifelong pursuit of the blood ancestor was due to the ongoing holocaust of the Jews in Germany during World War II. As a Jewish person himself, Cetrakian couldn't escape the capture. He and his mother were taken to a concentration camp, where Eichhorst was their commanding officer. Due to Cetrakian's carpentry skills, he was spared, but his mother wasn't as fortunate. One night, while Cetrakian was sleeping, he noticed a dark figure flash by. A creature stopped at the head of a man's bed, then began to thin his blood and twisted the man's head off on the spot. The sight horrified Cetrakian. The next day he talked to his companions about it, but they scoffed. And then Eichhorst came along. He was so pleased with Cetrakian's work that Eichhorst took him to his office. He took out a drawing and asked Cetrakian Lahan to make him something. While Eichhorst was out, he took a knife and hid it. After several days and nights of work Cetrakian made the object. And it was the coffin for the blood ancestor. He just didn't know it at the time. After completing his mission, Cetrakian went back to the camp. At night he saw the monster again. Cetrakian took out his dagger and tried to stop the monster. But the monster found him in the middle of it. And Cetrakian was instantly captured by the monster. Just when he thought he was going to die. The monster let him go. It may have been Cetrakian who built the coffin for him. But he still had his hands broken by the monster. The next day, Eichhorst gathered all the Jews outside. He was going to kill them all. Just as the execution was about to take place, a shot rang out in the distance, and Cetrakian Rahan escaped from the camp. On the other side, Eichhorst's army was defeated, and he fled into the secret base he had previously built. Blood Ancestor also found him at this time, because he was helped by Eichhorst. The Blood Ancestor decided to give him the power of a vampire. Five years later, Cetrakian married his lifelong love and had a child. But he never gave up hunting down the Blood Ancestor and his mother's revenge has yet to be avenged. Soon, Cetrakian discovered clues in a deep well. As he passed through a narrow passage, the sky grew dark. The blood ancestor, who was sleeping in the darkness, woke up. Only then did Cetrakian realize that he had been trapped. When he came to the mouth of the well, he found that the climbing rope had long disappeared. He roared and asked Eichhorst to have a life and death duel with him, but to no avail. He attempted to climb out but failed each time. After countless attempts, he finally managed to escape. When he emerged, he found that his horse had been slain. Hurrying home, Cetrakian was met with his wife and daughter, now turned into vampires. In his sorrow, Cetrakian beheaded them both.
then took his wife's heart and placed it in a jar. He swore to make the vampires pay. And so, 50 years later, the time for his revenge had come. Citrachian, along with F and others, formed a vampire hunting team to fight against the bloodthirsty creatures, 